welcome to the Chapter 4 Workout Problem video. Let's go ahead and get started with Problem 1. In this problem, we're identifying each of the following, A through F, as involving either demand or supply. And then we're going to draw a circular flow diagram and label the flows A through F. So let's go ahead and do demand and supply. Households in the labor market. So households in the labor market, or individuals, are supplying labor. Firms in the goods market. Firms are actually the suppliers of goods. Firms in the financial market. So firms in the financial market, they're actually demanding finances. For example, Coca-Cola, if they were to build a new a plant, right, or a new headquarters, they would, and they don't have the cash for it, they would then go to the bank and say, hey, we need uh, some money. And so that in that case, they would be demanding financials from the financial market. D, households in the goods market. So households or individuals are consumers and they're actually consuming the goods, right? So it'd be demand. They're demanding goods. E, firms in the labor market. So in this case, the firms are demanding labor. They actually get the labor, the firms, from households or individuals. And then F, households in the financial market. In this case, we're gonna go ahead and put supply. It could be demand or demand. It could be either or. And in this case, the households or individuals are suppliers when they invest their money or save their money, right? For retirement, stuff like that. They demand it when they go out and get a loan from the bank to buy a car or when they get a mortgage for a house. Okay, now let's go ahead and draw the circular flow, flow diagram. We're gonna start with A on top here. A is the households or individuals. And then we're gonna draw our first arrow. So this first arrow is gonna represent labor. The individuals or households are supplying labor to E, which is uh, firms in the labor market, right? So firms that buy up labor. We're gonna go ahead and connect this E to B which is also usually connected, right? So B is firms in the good market. They're actually gonna be using this labor to produce goods. And then they're gonna turn around and they're now selling their goods to D, households in the good market. So D, households in the good market. So now, households in the good market, if they aren't consuming, right? This right here is consumption. So with the money that the households have, they're gonna they're consuming. They have another option besides consuming and that is to save. So they can turn around, they, they have this money from working, from their labor that they just sold. They can either consume it and buy goods or they can save it. And in this case, they're gonna save it and F, right? So they're gonna, they're gonna be the suppliers of the financial market. And then uh, to end things up, we're gonna put C here. So C is the firms in the financial market. So they're actually going to be taking the money that the households are saving and they're gonna be using it to reinvest and buy more labor. So that's the circular flow diagram and kind of how it could be explained, right? Over, over here is the finances, right? Money. This right here is labor, finance, and then the goods are down here to the right. Let's go ahead and keep going with problem 2A. So what we're doing here is we're predicting how each of the following events will rise or lower the equilibrium wage and quantity of coal miners. So we're talking about a labor market here, right? So coal miners are coming to work in the mines, mine coal, and so uh, on this side, we're gonna say wage, right? So just like all of our other supply and demand graphs, wage is kind of the price for labor. And then down here, we're gonna have our quantity. And so, so we have to, in, so in each case, we're gonna sketch a demand and supply graph to illustrate our answer. Uh, but we have to predict how, how this is going to affect it. And the A, this is the first thing that affects, right? Price of oil rises. So what is oil to coal? It's a substitute, right? Okay, so it's used to like heat stuff or power stuff, right? So coal, or you could maybe use oil or gas, right? In that case, since it's a substitute, if the price rises, for oil, are people gonna buy more or less oil? They're gonna buy less, right? It's more expensive. And in turn, 
they're going to buy more coal. Demand for coal will rise, which means that the demand for the coal miners will rise. Demand curve. And uh, we've already kind of talked through this. And so what, what's going to happen is our demand is going to rise. So we're not, it's not actually going to uh, have an impact at all on supply. So what's going to happen is demand is going to shift uh, this direction, right? It's going to increase. It's going to shift to the right. There's an increase in demand. So here's our new demand curve right here, D1, the new demand curve, which means that our equilibrium is going to be changing from our original equi equilibrium, EO, right, to our new equilibrium, E1, we'll call it, right? So what does that do? That shifts quantity this direction, right? So we're gonna have an increase in quantity, we're increasing quantity, and then it also shifts price this direction, up. So we're gonna be increasing the wages, in this case, for coal miners, so it's going to raise the equilibrium wage and it's going to also raise the quantity of coal miners. So that's problem 2A. We're going to do that for 2B as well. So now for this one, we've got uh, new coal mining equipment is invented that is cheap and requires few workers to run. So how's this going to have an impact on uh, demand or supply? With knowing what this is, right? So equipment is this uh, something that is a complement to coal miners or is it going to end up being a substitute? This is going to substitute, right? So this is going to decrease the amount of coal miners or the demand for coal miners. It's going to look like this. So demand is going to be shifting this direction to the left. Then that will give us a new demand curve over this direction. It will look something like this. So this will be D1, the new demand curve. Equilibrium will also shift right here. So this is going to be E one as well, which means our quantity is going this direction, it's decreasing, and the wage or the price is going this direction as well, so it's decreasing. Introducing a new equipment that is invented, that makes it uh, cheaper and requires fewer workers, is going to have this effect on equilibrium wage, which is lower, and equilibrium quantity of coal miners is also going down. Problem 2C. Several major companies that do not mine coal open factories in West Virginia, offering a lot of well-paid jobs. So these aren't necessarily coal jobs, right? But it's still going to have a pull on the labor force. So people are going to be wondering if they should go into coal mining or maybe they can get a new job in another factory. So this is going to have an impact on supply. The supply of coal mine labor, the supply of people into the labor force, because coal miners are going elsewhere. So is that an increase in supply or a decrease in supply, right? They're going elsewhere, so that's definitely a decrease in supply. So we're going to be shifting this direction to the left. And so now our new supply curve is going to look something like this, S1. So let's take a look at how this impacts our equilibrium. This right here was EO, or the original equilibrium. Looks like a six, but that's an O. And then this one right here is E1. That's our new equilibrium. So what does it do? It's going to be shifting quantity to the left, which means less coal miners, which makes sense. They're going elsewhere, so there's not going to be as many. But at the same time, in order to get, get the amount of coal miners to keep the uh, coal miners coming and working for you, you've got to increase wages, so wages are going up in this case on problem 2C. Let's move on to problem 2D. Government imposes costly new regulations to make coal mining a safer job. Hopefully to help out those coal miners, right? We're going to help them out. Let's see in the end if we really help them out with their wages and availability of jobs. So there's wages there, SO as well. So is this going to impact, impact supply or demand? Well, in this case, it's actually going to have an impact on both. So the mandated expenditures for safety reduce the demand for labor. So companies are spending more money on regulations. They have less money to spend on workers, right? So in that case, demand will decrease. 
D1. What about supply? Well, let's imagine that coal mining now becomes a safer job. So the risk of coal mining was keeping workers away. But now that there's new regulations and safety precautions put in place, more people are coming to work in the mines or would be willing to work in the mines at the given uh, wage. So now we have an increase in supply. More people wanting to work in the mines because they're safer. So then supply is going to look like this. It's going to increase. Move to the right, S1. So let's go ahead and map this out with our equilibriums. So to begin with, this is the original equilibrium right here in blue. That's EO. Now we're going to map out in purple, we're going to map out the changes uh, with demand and supply separately. So when demand, the new demand comes and when, when demand falls because of increased cost, then this is going to be our new uh, equilibrium from demand. And when supply, and that's along the same original supply curve. Now when the new uh, supply, when supply increases because it's safer and people want to work in the mines, this is going to be our new equilibrium from the supply. But we, what we have to do is we have to combine these two, right? So we're going to combine the two and that's actually going to be the equilibrium that's going to stick, right? That's This is going to be our new equilibrium um, and that's right going to be right here. So this is our new equilibrium. This is E1 that matches up with supply and demand. And so what does that do to quantity and wages? Well, we go from the blue to the yellow now, right? So our wages are dropping. Wages are definitely going to drop. Uh, what's quantity going to do? It's really indeterminate. We're not sure. We're not sure what quantity is going to do. It could go up a little bit. It could go down a little bit. And so it's, it's what we call indeterminate, right? You can't determine what the change uh, in quantity is going to be unless you know the exact amount that the ship supply and demand are shifting then if you map it out exactly or if you look at the data exactly you'll then you'll be able to tell if quantity is going up or down but with this scenario it, we just can't tell it's indeterminate now we're going on to problem number three and we'll start with 3a so with this problem it says predict how each of the following economic changes will affect the equilibrium price and quantity in the financial market for home loans so we're looking at a financial market right and so since we're looking at a financial market we're going to be labeling our axes uh, right here vertical is going to be the rate as in percentage rate or rate of return and then uh, our x-axis our horizontal axis will be the quantity again uh, but really what that means in a financial market is quantity of money or how many dollars right how many dollars are being uh, traded in the market and then we're supposed to sketch uh, a demand and supply diagram to support your answers. So as we're predicting here, we're, we're going to start with A, the number of people at the most common ages for home buying increases. So then the, the number of people at the most common ages for home buying increases. So this is buying, right? So people that are buying homes, are they demanding? money from the financial markets or are they supplying money from the financial markets so in this case they're going to be demanding money so we're actually going to have a shift to demand and since the most common ages for home buying increases we're actually going to have an increase in demand so demand is going to be shifting to the right right from do and then we're going to actually create d1 so what does that do to our equilibrium rate or price and our equilibrium quantity? Well, the equilibrium starts out here, right? So this is the original equilibrium O, and then it's going to be shifting to here. So this is going to be equilibrium one. So in this case, we're seeing that the rate is actually rising and the quantity or dollar bills in the market are actually uh, increasing as well. Let's go on to 3B. Same setup, but this time for B we have it says people gain confidence that the economy is growing and that their jobs are secure. So as people gain confidence in the economy, 
and their jobs are secure. Are people borrowing more money in a, in a confident economy? That really is the, our takeaway on this one. So when people are confident in the economy and their jobs are secure, there's more borrowing of money. And so money that's in the financial markets are going to be borrowed. So the demand for money in the financial markets is going to increase. It's going to move to the right. We're going to come up with a new demand curve that's going to look like this, D1. And we're going to come up with a new equilibrium. So the original equilibrium is here, EO. And then the new equilibrium is right here, E1, right? Right there. And so again, the rate is increasing and quantity is also increasing. Let's go to 3C. And then let's go ahead and read the, uh, the scenario in, in problem 3C. It says banks that have made home loans find that a larger number of people than they expected are not repaying those loans. So in that case, we're not receiving the money back that we're lending, right? So we're not, we're not going to be able to lend it again. If you lose money out of the market from offering and from having bad loans, then that actually is an, a decrease in the supply in the market, right? So you're not able to get the money back in to relend it. And so what it looks like is, it looks like supply is gonna to shift to the left and we're gonna come up with a new supply curve S1. And then for our equilibrium, it's gonna look like this. So here's the original equi equilibrium and our new equilibrium, E1, is gonna be here. So that's actually an increase in the rate and a decrease in the quantity. 3D says because of a threat of a war, because of because of threat of a war, people become uncertain about the economic future. So it's almost opposite of, of I think it was uh, problem B, right? Where people are uh, becoming more uh, confident about the economy. In this case, they're becoming more uncertain or less confident. In, in this case, where they become more uncertain about the economy, there's actually gonna be less borrowing, right? So not as much demand for money from the financial market. So our demand is actually gonna to shift to the left. So that'll be D1. Our original equilibrium is here. And then our new equilibrium with the shift is going to be here. So that means that our rate is dropping and so is our quantity in the marketplace. So they're both decreasing with a decrease in demand. Now problem E. So it says here the overall level of saving in the economy diminishes. So just straight up, saving decreases, which really is one of the main sources of the supply in the financial markets, people saving their money. And so the supply is going to be shifted to the left. People saving and uh, for either retirement or, or just long-term saving, that's definitely going to be a hit to uh, our supply. And so we're going to be shifting from SO to S1. That means that our equilibrium will change from EO right here to E1, which means that we'll have an increase in the rates or the price of money, and we'll also have a or we'll have a decrease in quantity. So increase in rate, but a decrease in quantity. Now for our next one, problem 3F. The federal government changes its bank regulations in a way that makes it cheaper and easier for banks to make home loans. So in this way, the banks are able to answer the demand quicker. So they're able to supply more loans is the way it actually turns out. So their supply is actually increasing. So it's gonna be shifting to the right, supply will be. So that's S1. So our, our original equilibrium is here. And then with the shift, the equilibrium uh, moves to the right and downward. So that means our quantity is increasing, but our rate is decreasing. Now for problem four. So problem four is laid out in this way. So we have a table here with some information. We have interest rates, we have the supply, quantity supplied and quantity demanded in the financial market. So the, the, the table shows the amount of savings and borrowing in a market for loans to purchase homes measured in millions of dollars at, a ver at various interest rates. What is the equilibrium interest rate and quantity in the capital financial market? So again, this, this right here, the interest rate is 
the price, right? So originally when we looked at supply and demand, we had a price. And so the, the rate is the price in financial markets. And so really what we need to do is we need to find a price where quantity supplied and quantity demanded are equal. And so that's gonna be right here at 7%, right? 140, 140 in million, right? They're in millions. And so that's gonna be our equilibrium, interest rate and quantity. So the rate is 7%, the quantity is 140 million. So how can you tell? Well, you can tell because a quantity supplied and quantity demanded are gonna be equal at, at the equilibrium. Next question. Now imagine that because of a shift in the perceptions of foreign investors, the supply curve shifts so that there are 10 million less supplied at every interest rate. Calculate the new equilibrium interest rate and quantity and explain why the direction of the interest rate shifts makes intuitive sense. So let's go ahead and look at the supply. So this is what we're gonna be looking at is the supply side of things. I'm gonna go ahead and make this in red. So we're gonna actually have 10 million less Right, so this is 120, subtract 10, we got 125. So where's the new equilibrium gonna be? Well, it's gonna be right here, 8%, right? Because these now are equal, 135 supply, 135 demanded. So that is where it's gonna be. And it, and it makes sense because the perceptions of foreign investors are decreasing the supply, right? So we're having less inflow of money to go into the financial markets from investors, which means that the uh, demand is gonna remain pretty high, but we're going to equal out at 8% because we have to increase the price to come to equilibrium, right? So the price is 8%. Once we reach and increase that price, then demand will also fall off, right? So as price increases, demand decreases, it's inverse. Now for problem five. So 5A, imagine that to preserve the traditional way of life in small fishing villages, a government decides to impose a price floor that will guarantee all fishermen a certain price for their catch. The first part, using the demand and supply framework, predict the effects on the price, quantity demanded and quantity supplied. So let's let's talk about what it's gonna do to our equilibrium. So let's go ahead and draw out a uh, scenario right here. So now we're talking about fish, right? So this is this is something we're talking about. And so we're, we're, in, we're putting in a price floor. So the price floor is gonna look like this. So our, our price floor is actually above equilibrium. So one thing to note is that the floor, when you have a floor, it, unlike a room in your house where the floor is in the is below you when we look at supply and demand floors or are, are above equilibrium and ceilings are below right because when we have pressure on price we want it to go to equilibrium so the floor keeps it up right so if we have pressure downward towards equilibrium a floor is going to hold that up just like a floor holds you up right when you're in a house so that's kind of the way the floor works. So this is what the floor looks like. And so then these, this is the new quantity demanded right here. This is the new quantity supplied right here and right here. It should be at this level. This is equilibrium. This is where it wants to go, but it's not gonna go there because of the price floor. So they, the effects of the price on the price and quantity demanded, quantity supplied. So our price, at equilibrium will be here, right? This is our price at equilibrium. Our price with the floor is going to be higher. So that's gonna be our price with the floor. We'll do PF right there. That's an F. Okay, so our price is gonna be higher. Quantity demanded, this is equilibrium here. Quantity demanded will be lower, right? This is the demand. Supplies over here, quantity supplied will be higher, which will give us a surplus, right? More supply than demand because the, the prices are also going up. So let's go to problem 5B. With the enactment of this price floor for fish, what are some of the likely unintended consequences in the market? So just like we said before, right? So we're gonna have a surplus. So that's that's gonna be the main impact on the market. So we're gonna have a surplus of fish. Problem 5C suggests some policies other than the price floor working with 
uh, within the framework of demand and supply to make it possible for small fishing villages to continue. So uh, one better policy might be to, to help stimulate the demand for fish, right? So if you have more fish, then small fishing villages would be able to charge uh, higher prices. The demand for fish would be up, so they'd be able to charge higher prices or to make, be able to make a higher profit anyways, right? So this could be done through advertising or by arranging exclusive contracts for gov the government to buy just from the small fishing villages. Alternately, the, the fishermen could be offered a wage subsidy. So we're actually supporting the market of fish just by uh, saying, hey, fishermen, we're gonna pay you a certain amount for sure. We're gonna subsidize your wages, uh, which would also help the fishing villages as well. So it could be things like uh, advertising, advertising, it could be uh, wage subsidies, uh, it could also be uh, government contracts. So those are all things that might work as well, besides just putting a price floor. So we have problem number, number six. It says, what happens to the price and the quantity bought and sold in the cocoa market if countries producing cocoa experience a drought and a new study is released demonstrating the health benefits of cocoa? Illustrate your answer with a demand and supply graph. So let's, let's graph this out. So the effect on uh, the supply. So let's start with supply. First off, the drought, right? So we're gonna have a drought. That's gonna decrease supply. Not gonna be able to supply as, as many, uh, as much cocoa if we have a drought. So supply is gonna go down. So that's the new supply. So then we're gonna have an increase in demand because of this new study or this new information about the healthiness of cocoa. Demand is gonna increase. More people are gonna to wanna to get it, right? Maybe Oprah Winfrey or somebody says, hey, I'm eating cocoa now because it's so healthy, right? So demand's gonna go up. And so let's go through the changes in equilibrium here. So the original equilibrium is right here, right? SODO. This is original equilibrium. And then we have shifts because of demand and supply, but combined, the shifts are going to equal this. So S1 and D1. So what you're going to have is you're going to definitely have an increase in price. But your quantity is going to be indeterminate. You're not exactly sure if it's going to be, it depends on how much demand went up or how much supply went down, whether the quantity is actually gonna decrease or increase. We're not really sure. Thanks for listening and have a good day.